Okay, great. All right, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, uh, again, apologize as well for the technical difficulties, but we'll go ahead and get started. I know everyone's time is precious, uh, and we'll uh, wrap this thing uh, up on time. So, uh, the title of this Lunch and Learn that I'm giving is New Onset Seizures and Epilepsy in a Primary uh, Care Setting. And if we'll go over to the next slide. So the objectives of this talk, initially I'd listed four, but as I was um, uh, tidying up the presentation, I removed one. Right now, the main objectives I'd like is that by the end of this presentation, uh, the listeners will be able to list at least three types of events on history that should raise suspicion for possible seizures, uh, and two, uh, be able to discuss the initial care and counseling for a patient who's diagnosed with a first, -time, uh, first lifetime seizure or new onset epilepsy and three, list the key features on history of at least three epilepsy syndromes common in the pediatric population. Now, one of the things that I uh, recognize is that uh, uh, with this talk, uh, most of the participants, if not all, are pediatricians who are very well versed in uh, these issues, especially in primary care. And so the purpose of this talk isn't that I think I'm necessarily presenting you all with absolutely new, uh, new information, uh, but perhaps just packaging it in a different way uh, or in a way that will enable continued collaboration between um, pediatricians and primary care providers and uh, child neurologists. Next slide, please. So the outline of my talk is I'll start with a brief introduction mostly of myself, who am I, why am I giving this talk. Uh, we'll talk a bit about seizures and epilepsy and review the definition and uh, classification of uh, the epilepsies. Uh, we'll chat a little bit about how to recognize uh, seizures and um, potential pitfalls and things on the differential. Uh, and uh, we'll proceed on to think about, okay, once you have recognized uh, seizures, uh, what is the next best step and, and as far as triaging or diagnostic evaluations. Um, we'll review the initial management uh, for uh, seizures as well as once it's been diagnosed as epilepsy. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, seizure uh, safety as well as uh, counseling uh, once someone is diagnosed with epilepsy. Uh, and uh, we should have some time at the end to review uh, epilepsy syndromes. If anybody has any, uh, you know, burning questions while I'm going through the presentation, please feel free to ask, but otherwise I plan on having enough time uh, at the end for uh, questions and open discussion. All right, next slide, please. So starting off with uh, who am I? Uh, my name is uh, Juma Mbwana, Dr. Mbwana. I'm a child neurologist here at Children's National Health System within the Division of Neurology uh, with a faculty appointment at uh, uh, GWU George Washington as an assistant professor of neurology and pediatrics. I completed a full pediatrics uh, residency at the Yale New Haven Hospital, and following that I did uh, child Neurology Fellowship at the Children's Hospital of, uh, of Philadelphia. So I am one of those uh, medical practitioners who sort of moved at every uh, stage of their uh, uh, training and eventually work, which uh, you know, one of the wonderful things is it provided me with the experience of uh, working in different populations and within different uh, sort of uh, hospital settings. What I do at Children's uh, National right now is I have a general child neurology clinic and I go to two of our ROCs regional um, outpatient clinics, one out in Annapolis and one in Howard County. The one in Howard County is located in Fulton. Uh, at the Annapolis ROC, I also do the new onset epilepsy clinic there as well, which I'll uh, mention at uh, another point uh, during this lecture. Uh, in addition to that, I'm a neurohospitalist at the uh, main hospital itself. I do some inpatient time, uh, and I do have some research uh, interests and studies uh, to do with epilepsy, namely uh, the use of uh, electronic health record systems with epilepsy and also language and how it affects, how it's affected uh, in epilepsy. The reason why um, uh, we thought of doing this talk is, uh, you know, there's multiple reasons actually. One of them is that uh, seizures and epilepsy constitute the most common diagnoses amongst uh, child neurologist uh, patients. Um, you know, just thinking anecdotally uh, for myself, I, off the top of my head, I think at least half, uh, if not more than half of the patients that I see in any given week um, either have a diagnosis of epilepsy or I'm seeing them for suspected seizures, uh, whether these uh, end up being seizures uh, or not. Um, overall, the incidence of childhood epilepsy has been found to be as high as uh, eight per 
a 1,000 person uh, year. So it is a relatively high, you know, how, how I usually term it to my patients um, is I tell them that uh, childhood epilepsy may be uncommon in that they might not know somebody else or none of their neighbors or relatives uh, has epilepsy. Uh, but at a regional center such as Children's National, we see a lot uh, of epilepsy. So it is common uh, to us, even if it may be uncommon to our um, individual patients. Now, what's really important is that uh, patients who have a new diagnosis of seizures or epilepsy, they're often first seen by their pediatrician. Uh, and a nationwide survey actually found that up to 60% of people with a diagnosis of epilepsy first consulted their primary care provider uh, for their diagnosis. Uh, in pediatrics, I believe that number, again, anecdotally, is higher. Um, this uh, nationwide survey included both children and adults, uh, and I think people tend to be a bit more um, careful with their, uh, with their children in that if there's anything even remotely bring up a question of seizures, they'll bring the child to their pediatrician as opposed to adults where someone may have symptoms for a bit and think it's something else or not come to medical attention. And so uh, really with um, uh, our, our patients that we see in the child neurology clinic, uh, most of them are referred by uh, uh, by you, by the pediatricians and community providers, and so we think this is uh, really important. Um, the key areas of uh, collaboration that I didn't indicate here, but that I'll highlight throughout the talk, one of them is in the initial diagnosis of a seizure or epilepsy and making the referral to us as a child neurologist. Uh, Second area of collaboration is in the diagnostic evaluation. Uh, sometimes depending on location and circumstance, the pediatrician may be the one doing an initial uh, evaluation prior to being seen by the child neurologist. Uh, the third uh, area of collaboration is um, uh, monitoring for uh, side effects of any medications that have been started since you may be seeing the patients a bit more frequently. Uh, and lastly, uh, in the counseling, um, uh, because uh, when you see the when you see the uh, children with their parents uh, and you're giving all your uh, guidance, um, it, questions may come up that are more related to epilepsy and want to make sure that you're comfortable uh, in answering those questions. Next slide, please. So just starting off with uh, definitions, and we're going by the ILAE definitions, International League Against Epilepsy. An epileptic seizure is defined as a transit occurrence of sign or symptoms due to abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity uh, in the brain. Um, how I explain that to uh, parents in sort of more common terms is I tell them that uh, we all have electricity in our brains, and that's how the different parts of the our brain communicate with each other, but it's in a very well-organized or well-ordered fashion. And if anything were to happen to disrupt that normal flow, that's when you see a seizure occurring. Epilepsy uh, is a disease of the, de of the brain defined by any of the following conditions. One is at least two unprovoked seizures occurring over 24 hours apart. That's really important, the 24-hour period, because sometimes we have patients who have two seizures within an hour or two seizures within just a couple of hours, and we'll count that as uh, one event. Um, the second uh, thing that can qualify for a diagnosis of epilepsy is if you have one unprovoked seizure and a probability of further seizures similar to the general recurrence risk of at least 60% after two unprovoked seizures occurring over the next 10 years. Uh, Commonly for us as child neurologists, uh, that second point comes up after you've done the diagnostic testing. Uh, if someone has an abnormal EEG with certain abnormalities or an abnormal brain MRI with particular abnormalities, that elevates their seizure risk. And so even if they've only had one seizure, um, we can still give that diagnosis of epilepsy. Uh, and thirdly, a diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome. Um, that again may come after the diagnostic testing uh, once you get uh, results that point towards the specific syndrome uh, that the person has, even if they don't have uh, recorded uh, more than one unprovoked seizure. Next slide, please. And so the main point over here is that, um, uh, sorry, just go back. Yes, sorry. Uh, the main point is that a seizure is an event uh, and epilepsy is the disease evol involving recurrent 
uh, unprovoked uh, seizure is really important because quite often uh, parents, um, even uh, when it's explained, especially in the emergency department, when there's a lot of things going on, uh, that point can be missed. So if someone has come in and, and they've had just one seizure, uh, they do not have epilepsy unless one of the other things that I mentioned have occurred. Right, next slide, please. I wanted to review the classification of the epilepsies, even though that is something that uh, kind of falls a bit more to us as a child neurologist and less to uh, the primary care provider, just because some of the terms that we use, you're, you're going to uh, be seeing them in the notes that we um, uh, give for the patient or in our discussions with you. Uh, uh, click, please. So the way that uh, epilepsy is uh, classified uh, currently, according to IL ILAE, uh, is you start by defining the seizure type, uh, whether uh, someone has had a focal seizure, a generalized seizure, or sometimes it's actually unknown, particularly if the seizure was not witnessed. Um, that informs the epilepsy type, where uh, someone can be defined as having a focal epilepsy, a generalized epilepsy, combined to generalized and focal, or the epilepsy could be unknown. Um, excuse me, the, leading to that, you may uh, be able to diagnose an epilepsy syndrome uh, in addition, as if someone does qualify for the diagnosis of, of a syndrome, such as childhood absence epilepsy, then that becomes their diagnosis, rather than a focal epilepsy uh, or generalized epilepsy. We also make reference to the etiology uh, of the epilepsy, and that is something that is considered at the time of diagnosis and uh, later on as well, uh, because each one of these, whether we think the etiology could be structural, genetic, infectious, metabolic, uh, immune or unknown can inform the uh, workup process and can also inform uh, the, the medications that you uh, choose. Uh, we consider comorbidities as well, even though that might not be distinctly part of the uh, definition. Uh, two points I want to raise uh, just about the, this new classification system uh, that's used is that, um, one, again, the etiology should be considered at presentation at every step along the uh, diagnostic uh, workup. Uh, and secondly, previously uh, some uh, epilepsies were defined as benign, uh, but that term is now being replaced by saying self-limited, uh, and where applicable, uh, we uh, mentioned the pharmacoresponsiveness uh, of the epilepsy, and so if it's uh, one that is uh, more pharmacoresponsive versus not. Uh, next slide, please. All right, now we're going to get into recognizing seizures, something that I know um, uh, your pediatricians and um, other primary care providers do very well because uh, I, I see the patients. You always make appropriate referrals, but I thought it was important just to kind of go over it and kind of uh, let you know the things that we specifically think of when we're seeing uh, these patients in the clinic. Uh, when we see the patient, the most important uh, part uh, of the initial uh, diagnostic evaluation is the history. Uh, sometimes we'll have a video, uh, which can be very useful, but in the absence of that, we're going by uh, what we're told. Things that we look for uh, in the pre-ictal state before the specific event or episode has occurred, and really importantly, before I confirm it's a seizure, I always use the term event or episode just in the case that it doesn't end up being a seizure. So. Um, prior to the event, I'd like to know, was the patient asleep uh, or awake? Uh, were they relaxed or were they um, actively doing something? Um, was this occurring in the, context of, in the context of sickness? Particularly, was there a fever or was the child um, upset? Um, these are really important. Seizures more commonly occur in sleep rather than wake, but they can occur in wakefulness, uh, but it's good to get that understanding, particularly if there's been more than one event. Um, knowing whether someone is sick or has a fever is important because uh, that can help inform whether you're talking about a provoked seizure or a febrile seizure. Uh, and knowing if they're upset is also important because if it's a younger child, uh, you'd be thinking about could this be, excuse me, potentially a breath holding spell. If it's someone who's uh, older, could this be uh, something that's a uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizure? Uh, you want to know what symptoms the patient had before uh, 
uh, the spell. Uh, I usually like to have them say in their own words um, what, if anything, they're feeling, or if there are other people present, if they told them anything. Uh, some of the key things that we hear uh, people say when they indeed had a seizure is they may just say uh, they weren't feeling right without being able to spe specify any further. Um, observers might say all of a sudden they looked or started talking in a funny manner, uh, which could be slurred speech or just saying things that didn't make sense. Um, other things that we want to hear about, especially because they might uh, indicate it was not uh, an actual epileptic seizure, is uh, if there was dizziness or if the patient describes that things suddenly started getting dark uh, or lightheadedness, uh, things that might suggest syncope uh, or other causes. Um, and also uh, anxiousness or anxiety, which goes with the setting uh, because that might uh, make you think of potentially a panic attack or, uh, again, a psychogenic non-epileptic uh, uh, seizure. We want to know what occurred during the episode with the body. Was there a loss of tone uh, uh, resulting in uh, limpness, or, or was there stiffness, and if so, of which body part? Uh, was there a change in color uh, anywhere, particularly um, the face? Uh, were the eyes closed or open, uh, and were there uh, movements of the limbs? Um, on all those points, I often ask if parents witness it, I just ask them to reenact um, the, what they saw for me, because uh, that, that's very useful in uh, helping to differentiate, especially uh, epileptic versus non-epileptic spells. We want to know about the responsiveness during the episode. Was the child able to uh, sort of be brought out of it? Um, and we also want to know about uh, tongue biting, because that is something that could indicate um, that um, a, a seizure had taken place. Very importantly, we want to know about the duration as well. You know, an event that occurs for uh, one to three minutes uh, will make us think that it could be a seizure versus something that lasted for uh, an hour or so, particularly if following that, um, the child very quickly got back to their baseline. Um, so important things we want to know. Uh, what happened after uh, the event? Uh, was there any sort of altered mental status, which could include uh, sedation or aggression? Um, did the child appear fatigued or drowsy? Uh, did they complain of a headache or was there any emesis? Um, or especially if the event itself was not witnessed, are there any injuries? Like did they, you know, hurt their lip or do they have like a visible bruise um, on any part of their body or a head injury indicating they fell? Uh, because those sorts of things would, um, confirmed that there was a fall, which uh, could likely be uh, seizures. Um, and we also want to know about the recurrence. You know, is this something that happened one time and then by the time they're seeing you or seeing us, it hasn't happened again? Or did it happen several times that day or the following day? Um, that's a very useful for that as well. Um, you definitely want to take in the context uh, of uh, the, any potential risk factors the a patient may have. Uh, common ones include any prior brain injury from hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy uh, at birth or intraventricular um, hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhage uh, prenatally or perinatally. Those uh, sorts of things, if known, uh, should uh, raise a red flag. Uh, certain genetic disorders, if they're known, such as uh, tuberous sclerosis, that would make you uh, have a higher suspicion that an event is a uh, Family history. Uh, and with the family history, uh, it, it doesn't mean that someone does have to have someone in their family who has seizures. And at the same time, if there's just one single family member who had a, uh, a seizure in infancy and never again, that uh, isn't really a red flag. But if there's a report of several family members, uh, in more than one generation who've had uh, seizures, particularly if they confirm it needed medication, that does make you think that there could be a genetic uh, underlying cause. Autism and developmental delay have been associated with the increased seizure risk, uh, and so we do think of uh, patients uh, who have that as uh, you know, more likely to have a seizure uh, than not. Um, other sort of in general clues uh, that you should uh, look for, and I apologize for not indicating them here, uh, but if a child uh, or parents report that uh, they intermittently wake up in the morning tired with no uh, good reason, even though they slept well that previous evening, uh, if there are complaints of uh, frequent arousals or awakening or poor sleep, uh, that could be an indication of nocturnal uh, seizures. Uh, if there's unexplained poor performance in school, and that means that a child is um, applying themselves as well as they typically did, uh, but the school performance uh, is just uh, academically just uh, getting worse and worse, um, it's possible uh, 
uh, that they could be uh, having uh, seizures at night. And so just important considerations to think of. And uh, also, and I know uh, you guys do this really well, but as pediatricians, just thinking of uh, what uh, other things uh, it could be on the differential, whether we're talking about breath holding spells or syncope, uh, such that if a referral is made to a neurologist, um, you're also uh, thinking about what else you may have to do as far as any testing or any referral. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so you've seen uh, the patient in your clinic uh, and you have a very high suspicion of uh, a seizure uh, and it's a new seizure, so what do you do? Uh, you uh, have two, two options, well, you know, several, but the two main options that I highlight here is one is a referral to, our, um, to a neurology clinic. Um, at a Children's National, most likely, you'd be referred to a general child neurology clinic. Uh, even though we do have epileptologists who have epilepsy clinic, quite often they're seeing patients with refractory epilepsy and their wait times may, depending on location, uh, may differ. And many of them do have general child neurology clinic as well. Um, so that is one option. Uh, a newer option, and this is something that we've been doing over the past month, is we have a new onset epilepsy clinic. Uh, but currently that's only in our Annapolis location, but anybody uh, I can be referred there. You don't have to be from uh, that general uh, referring area. With the new onset epilepsy clinic, uh, we have um, a time and space specifically blocked out for new diagnoses of epilepsy uh, and seizures, uh, such that our aim right now is to guarantee uh, a clinic appointment within a week uh, with an EEG if possible. And so in certain situations, you may want to um, uh, have the patient seen there so they can be seen sooner. Uh, because sometimes our wait times for the general child neurology clinic uh, can be uh, a couple of weeks. Um, you also have the option of doing an emergency uh, department evaluation if you think things are more emergent and someone needs um, urgent testing and possible admission or to be seen by a neurologist the same day, uh, then you can send the child to the emergency department. One additional uh, resource, again, I didn't uh, indicate it there, but if you do call our main hospital line uh, as a community uh, provider, as a community uh, pediatrician, uh, you can request to speak to a neurologist and you'll get connected to uh, the attending neurologist. We do have uh, someone who's allocated as the physician of the day specifically to answer your questions. And many of the questions that I often get is uh, descriptions of a child who may or may not be having seizures. And uh, I kind of go through with whoever uh, talked to me about what uh, I think could be going on and whether the child needs to be seen very urgently or a bit less urgently. So you have those options. Uh, things that you should consider to help guide whether uh, the child uh, should be seen in clinic uh, or the emergency department is the differential diagnosis. Uh, certain diagnoses like possible infantile spasms do need uh, urgent workup and management because of the high risk of developmental delay. Uh, and so if you do have a child who you actually think this could be infantile spasms, um, the preference would be for them to be admitted uh, so that we can do an EEG to either um, rule, confirm or rule out uh, the diagnosis. Uh, and to do that, again, if you are seeing the child in the clinic that day, if you call uh, our neurology line, we'll be able to assist you in arranging for uh, an admission. The patient's age is really important. Uh, you know, in this talk, I'm really not covering neonatal uh, seizures because that's a whole topic on its own. But if you have a child who's uh, less than a month old or even, you know, anywhere from uh, four months uh, or younger and you uh, really do think that seizures are a possibility, uh, they probably want to be seen sooner. Uh, even if maybe not the emergency department, that is a very appropriate referral to the new onset epilepsy clinic so we can uh, very quickly determine as best as we can whether or not these are uh, indeed seizures. You definitely want to consider the event duration, frequency, and other uh, details. If someone is having daily spells, particularly if they're uh, debilitating in one way or another, uh, they should be seen more promptly. Um, and as, if they're daily, it's probably going to be easier for us to determine if they're seizures or not by putting them on EEG. Um, increasing frequency of spells. So if a child is having something once a month, but now parents are saying it's happening, uh, it came to once a week and then daily, uh, we probably want to see them a bit more urgently. Uh, and also if there's any prolonged period of altered mental status or, po or a, a post-dictal period, 
uh, you know, we expect that after a one to three minute long seizure, the postictal period can last anywhere from 10 minutes uh, up to a couple of hours. But if indeed it is a couple of hours, you expect there to be gradual improvement during that time. Uh, the presentation on physical and physical exam is also really important because if you have new focal findings on exam after a seizure, uh, the person probably needs an emergency department evaluation. Uh, and if there's any encephalopathy at the time that you're seeing the patient, which would probably be um, hours or days after the event, then that's also uh, concerning uh, and uh, may need uh, workup for an uh, encephalitis. And so again, you can contact us and we can uh, work on the best way to evaluate the child. As far as the diagnostic evaluation um, that I sort of listed there, some of those are things that may be done uh, already if the child went to an emergency department. Um, some are things that you may choose to do in your clinic, but many of these are things that uh, we would uh, direct as a child neurologist. Uh, most children will get, uh, if they're seen within minutes or hours of a seizure, will get uh, general lab work, including toxicology screens. Um, not many emergency departments um, outside of uh, Children's National will do um, EEGs, although I believe Anne Arundel Medical Center, uh, I think they do that uh, sometimes. But we will often get, uh, well, not often, if we really think there's a seizure, we'll arrange for an EEG, whether that's going to be inpatient or outpatient. And sometimes we do the overnight uh, EEGs depending on uh, acuity uh, as well. Um, head imaging, head ultrasound if the child um, has an open fontanelle, head CT if uh, it's more uh, emergent and you want to rule out intracranial pathology, uh, or a brain MRI uh, if uh, you've a diagnosed seizure and you uh, basically want to get a pic, uh, you want to know the anatomy, but you believe you have time. Uh, and things that we do later on, um, and most of the time not at the time of initial diagnosis, are uh, lumbar puncture for CSF analysis, as well as genetic and uh, metabolic testing. Uh, what I do uh, see from uh, some referrals is sometimes they do come and they've already gotten a routine uh, EEG, uh, which uh, sort of helps me along uh, the way. But again, that's not something that you have to do. That's something that we can arrange. Uh, and sometimes uh, head imaging as well. And, and again, that's something that uh, we can arrange once we've uh, seen uh, the patient. Next slide, please. So for the initial management, so once you have uh, seen the, the patient and you've confirmed that these are uh, seizures, according to the uh, AAN uh, practice parameters for treatment of a child with the first unprovoked seizures, uh, one of the, the things that sort of informs what the recommendations are is the fact that the majority of children who experience the first unprovoked seizure will have few or no recurrences. Therefore, the recommendations are that treatment with an anti-epileptic drug is not indicated for the prevention of the development of epilepsy. Uh, and therefore, if it's a single first unprovoked seizure, you do not have to um, start an anti-epileptic uh, drug treatment, and indeed, we most often don't. Um, however, treatment with an AED may be considered in circumstances where the benefits of reducing the risk of a second seizure outweigh the risks of pharmacologic or psychologic, uh, the psychosocial uh, side effects. Uh, so if we have diagnosed epilepsy, either because there have been two seizures, um, one seizure plus uh, abnormal findings on diagnostic exam indicating an increased risk, or if they're diagnosed with a seizure, an epilepsy syndrome, uh, then we do feel that the risk of a second seizure does outweigh um, those risks, and so we uh, therefore start medication. Uh, most of the time, um, in my experience, uh, the medications are either started in the emergency department uh, uh, with the recommendations of a neurologist, or um, we start them in our clinic. But certainly, if you see a patient and uh, you feel that, uh, you know, very high confidence that they have uh, seizures and um, there's any uh, sort of delay in, uh, in referral, I have seen some pediatricians who will start a medication and uh, uh, quite often it's uh, the right or correct choice of medication because the uh, AAP and, uh, you know, you have other resources, not just us, to uh, um, uh, uh, help you out with those situations. Uh, next slide, please. So with the initial uh, management, um, two things to consider. One is the use of a rescue medicine. Uh, anyone who's had a seizure longer than uh, three minutes or five minutes, uh, we often will prescribe a rescue medicine uh, unless they're below the age of 12 months. But uh, anyone older 
uh, we will. That may vary from a neurologist to neurologist, so there's some cases where it may not happen, there, uh, but in a lot of cases it will. Our two main options are diastat rectal gel and the clonazepam oral dissolving uh, tablet or wafer, the clon uh, clonopin. Um, my preference is uh, if it's a child uh, who's uh, a toddler or an uh, who is walking age, uh, you know, they'll get diastat rectal gel. That's often easier for parents uh, or daycare providers to give. Uh, if it's a school-age child, particularly an adolescent, um, I use a clonazepam oral dissolving uh, tablet or wafer uh, because that's, uh, you know, I guess the best way to put it is that it's a bit more socially acceptable if it has to be given uh, during school hours. And studies have shown that uh, they are both equivalent in as far as stopping seizures. Uh, and so I have a discussion with the, a parent, with the parents of the child and the child themselves and tell them what the two different rescue medicines entail and, um, you know, help them participate in that decision of which one uh, to use. For daily preventative medicine, uh, we, of course, have a wide variety of antiepileptic drugs we can use. Uh, the ones that I've listed here are the ones that we more commonly use as at the initial uh, diagnosis. Um, and I'll uh, go through them really briefly. So uh, Keppra, uh, Leviteracetam, we use it for focal or generalized epilepsy. Um, it's uh, actually between that and oxcarbazepine, those are our two most commonly prescribed medications. Uh, and the most common side effect that we see with the Keppra is a behavioral change, which in a toddler can manifest as doing things like uh, kicking, biting, screaming, um, which they didn't used to do, or for an older child, getting more argumentative and doing things that are completely not age appropriate. Uh, for trileptal, we use that for focal epilepsies, and it's actually uh, a relative contraindication for generalized epilepsy, so we don't use it for that. Uh, and its common side effects are hyponatremia uh, and potentially a rash. For valproate uh, or valproic acid, we use that for focal, multifocal, or generalized epilepsies. Uh, the common side effects uh, are hepatotoxicity, uh, thrombocytopenia, PCOS, and congenital malformations. Uh, and I should say, even though I'm saying common, it doesn't mean that most people have them. It just means it's the most common, the uh, most commonly observed uh, side effect. But indeed, many of our patients don't get any uh, of these side effects, but we're always vigilant uh, for it. And in the cases of something like valproate, we do monitor um, uh, liver enzyme levels periodically. Ethosuximide is used only for absence epilepsy. It doesn't work for any other uh, epilepsy uh, type, uh, and its main side effects are sedation and GI discomfort. Uh, and uh, lastly, lamotrigine, which we don't often use it as a first line, but sometimes we will. Uh, it can be used for focal or generalized epilepsies, and the main side effect we get concerned about is Stevens-Johnson syndrome, particularly if uh, it's being started too fast or just at the time that it's being started uh, or uh, as it's being, uh, doses are being changed. Uh, this is another key area of collaboration with uh, the primary care providers uh, because uh, with many of these side effects, you may be the first ones to notice them. And with some of them, we actually uh, counsel our patients to come to you first if they think they might be having them. For example, if I have a patient who's on trileptal, uh, I let them know that if the child goes through a period of not eating or drinking well or, and or having emesis or diarrhea, uh, I recommend that they're seen by the primary care provider who can assess whether this could be uh, some sort of uh, viral illness uh, and uh, to check electrolytes to make sure that there's no uh, imbalance. And uh, for lamotrigine, if I have a patient who's on lamotrigine or trileptal and they call and say that they're developing a rash, you know, ask the initial uh, questions regarding um, the location of the rash, but I often do ask them to, again, see the primary care provider to determine is this, uh, uh, you know, a drug reaction rash or Stevens-Johnson, or could this be a viral um, rash or something of that sort. Next slide, please. So once someone has had a seizure, um, these are the things that we discuss with the, uh, with the parents, uh, and I'm sure they also have a lot of questions for you all as the primary care providers. Um, what uh, I specifically tell parents to do in the event of a seizure, if another one was to occur, uh, is to pay attention to the length of the seizure. Very important uh, so that uh, they would know if they need to give the rescue medication or not. Assure physical safety of the child. So that may be by laying them down and moving objects away. You know, if they're on an 
elevated service uh, or any place that can injure themselves, taking them down from there. Uh, not to put anything at all in the child's mouth for the duration of the seizure or as long as they're um, altered and not acting like themselves. Uh, of course, administer the rescue medication. The seizure lasts longer than three minutes. Uh, and if it's the first time that, they, that they're giving the rescue medication, they should very strongly consider, and I should tell them to go ahead and either call uh, EMS or take the child to the emergency department uh, if they're given it, um, just because it means, number one, the seizure was long, and they might have excessive sedation from uh, the rescue medication. Um, I also counsel them to uh, take them to the emergency department or call EMS if they're uh, really not returning to their baseline or really if they have any concerns, because sometimes it might not be something that the parents can verbalize. I tell them, you know, they're never wrong to take their child to the emergency department after a seizure. And then, of course, notify us uh, once it is safe and appropriate so we can discuss whether or not we need to start medications or uh, come back to see us in the clinic or whatever the next best step is. Uh, for water safety, uh, they should take showers and not baths for the older children and do not lock the bathroom door. Um, they can still swim. That's a very common question. Yes, they can, but they need one-to-one -one supervision by an adult uh, while swimming, an adult who's not swimming, an adult who is observing. Uh, and for driving for the older children, uh, if they've had a seizure, um, they are not allowed to drive for a specified amount of time, uh, and that amount of time varies depending on where they live. If they're in D.C., that's 12 months. In Maryland, it's three months, and in Virginia, it's uh, six uh, months. Uh, and following that, they can, uh, they can go ahead and drive. If they already have a driver's license, there are forms that need to be filled, and those can always just be sent uh, to us as the neurologist, and we're uh, so happy to fill them out. Uh, and overall, I tell them to be smart. You know, even if you're in Maryland and more than three months have passed, it's been four months since your seizure, but uh, for some reason they just don't feel ready, then they shouldn't rush into it because they, they, they know more about how they feel than we do. Uh, next slide, please. If someone has now been diagnosed with epilepsy, so it's not just um, a single seizure, um, there are a lot of questions that come up, and sometimes some of these do come up as well, uh, even when it's just a single uh, seizure. Um, as far as prognosis, uh, in children it's different from adults. Over 50% with non-syndromic epilepsy will achieve complete uh, remission, and uh, things that favor uh, that outcome are early seizure control, a younger age of onset, and absence of an underlying brain disorder. Uh, children with epilepsy may have uh, cognitive, academic, psychosocial, or behavioral uh, problems that could be related to the frequent seizures or the underlying chronic neurological uh, condition. Um, however, it's important to note that many children with epilepsy continue to lead typical uh, healthy uh, lives, and so it doesn't mean that any of those things will specifically happen, but parents can be on the lookout. Um, a resource that I often give to parents uh, when there's a new diagnosis is the Epilepsy Foundation of America, which is www.epilepsy.com, uh, which is a parent and patient uh, driven group uh, that has a lot of resources that can be used to parents or uh, to educators. Uh, it has forums where they can participate and uh, talk with um, other parents or patients, and uh, there are local chapters, and so they can meet people in person. I tell them, you know, uh, it's one thing to hear um, uh, me as a physician talking, but it's another to hear it straight from a parent. So I always give them that um, that information. Um, they ask about length of treatment, and for us, for most of the syndromes or most, uh, sorry, uh, epilepsies, uh, we continue anti-seizure treatment until a patient has been seizure-free for at least two years. So the time of diagnosis, they will most likely be on the medicine for at least two years. Uh, for any women of childbearing age, we recommend uh, folic acid uh, because um, uh, it's been shown that uh, women with epilepsy who are, not, or who are on anti-epileptic drugs have a higher chance of uh, folic acid deficiency, uh, which would not be good if they were to get pregnant. And I tell all my patients that um, I'm not passing any judgment on lifestyle or anything of that sort, but I tell all of them that I recommend they be on folic uh, acid uh, if they are um, uh, post-puberty. Next slide, please. One of the very, very important uh, things that we discuss, it's an uncomfortable discussion, but we have to have it, uh, is about SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Some parents uh, just ask right on, you know, can my child die from this? 
can my child die in their sleep? Uh, and, uh, you know, it would be very easy for us to say no, uh, but then that would not be a complete and honest answer because uh, we now have a lot of information about SUDEP, which is the sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, and it's defined as sudden, unexpected, non-traumatic, and non-drowning death in patients with epilepsy with or without evidence of a seizure. That in excludes a status epilepticus. The most significant risk factor um, is frequent generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Click, please. So the practice guidelines for SUDA by the AAN, um, what they have shown is that the incidence overall, it's rare, affects uh, one in uh, 4,500 children with epilepsy. So most people we diagnose will not um, have SUDEP, but it is a possibility and important to discuss. Click, please. Uh, we, uh, they also recommend that uh, we inform patients that for those who continue to uh, have generalized tonic-clonic seizures, we should continue to actively manage the therapies to reduce the frequency of uh, seizures and therefore the risk of uh, SUDEP. Uh, click, please. For persons with frequent generalized tonic-clonic and uh, nocturnal seizures, um, you know, we uh, do, it has been shown that doing specifically nocturnal supervision, whether that's somebody else in the room or other um, or remote sort of listening devices can reduce SUDEP risk. And again, this is for those with generalized tonic-clonic seizures and nocturnal seizures. Click, please. Uh, and uh, we also uh, inform patients that, uh, uh, patients with seizure freedom, um, that if you have seizure freedom, that's more strongly associated with, with decreased uh, risk of SUDEP. And so that's why we like them to be on their medications, come and see us for appointments so we can make sure they're getting, uh, they get to seizure freedom. Next slide, please. All right, so um, I now want to go in to talk about epilepsy uh, syndromes and the main thing that I'm going to focus on with each one of the syndromes in the interest of time uh, is uh, what you'll see on the history and presentation to give you a suspicion uh, to uh, make a neurology referral. So for childhood absence epilepsy, which is uh, actually, I believe, the most common or one of the most common um, epilepsies that uh, have a childhood onset, uh, what will happen is a child will have an arrest of activity with no loss of tone. Parents will commonly describe that as a staring spell or zoning out. They may have automatisms during the spell, which can include lip, eye, or hand movements that are stereotyped. Uh, if a seizure happens uh, while they're standing or walking, they may walk in an abnormal pattern, which may include walking in circles or walking into walls. I had a patient, uh, more than one patient, who walked into traffic until they were grabbed by their parents. Uh, and the patients have no awareness of the seizure, so they will not be able to tell you that they can feel themselves zoning out. Um, those are the key features. If you see any of those, uh, uh, please refer them to uh, us in neurology. Sometimes um, I, I, I'll say more commonly I have a lot of pediatricians who will go ahead and do the EEG so that by the time I'm seeing uh, the patient, they have the confirmed EEG signature, three hertz spike and wave, and we can uh, go on to the next step, which is talking about treatment. And with the childhood absence epilepsy, we do let them know that remission occurs in 66 to 90 percent of patients, depending on which studies uh, you look at. And some patients do uh, progress to juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Next slide, please. And speaking of the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, it is also relatively common, accounting for 10% of all cases of epilepsy. Um, occurs in a slightly older population, 12 to 18 years old, compared to childhood absence epilepsy. And the main features will be uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, uh, myoclonic jerks, which occur frequently in the morning, as well as absence seizures. The myoclonic jerks are actually the most common symptom, but because they're frequently not recognized as uh, a seizure uh, type, um, the patient's not brought to medical attention until they have the generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, absence seizures can occur as well, and these symptoms are aggravated by sleep deprivation and alcohol consumption. Uh, and so it was actually my experience when I was doing adult neurology that uh, college was a time that uh, many people were diagnosed with JME because they had it, but it was just brought out by the sleep deprivation and or alcohol consumption that may occur uh, in college. Um, next slide, please.
Uh, BEC or BRE, benign epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes, uh, also known as benign rolandic epilepsy, is also relatively common. Patients with this epilepsy type, um, they'll report a, a focal seizures at night and motor symptoms involving the face with no impairment of uh, consciousness. Uh, and the kind of things that they'll describe is uh, someone next to them will say that they're making funny, uh, they're making funny sounds or they're having hypersalivation or their eyes twitching. Uh, sometimes the patient will just say all of a sudden they couldn't speak or, or their mouth was doing funny things. Um, and again, these are happening mostly at night. And they can uh, progress to have generalized chronic chronic seizures during sleep. Uh, and if they're happening frequently enough, they can spill over to the daytime as well. Uh, one of the really important things with this seizure type is classically um, remission occurs in most patients by the time of early adolescence, and the seizures are infrequent, uh, and because they're just the focal seizures, we often do not treat with medication. Most patients will not be started on a medicine, but for those who either uh, prefer that or are having very frequent seizures, um, there are several medications we can use. The most common is oxcarbazepine. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, infantile spasms, which is a whole complete lecture on its own, and so I won't go into a lot of detail with it. Other than that, uh, we see this most commonly uh, in patients between three to eight months of age, not that common in older patients. Uh, it can be sporadic or in the presence of genetic disorders or epileptic encephalopathies, and so your child who's been otherwise completely normal can have this, as with uh, those who have genetic disorders. Um, they'll have the spasms, which uh, the description of that is going to be a sudden brief contraction of one or more muscle groups, followed by a longer uh, tonic phase. And it's one of those things where the more you see it, the more you recognize it, but there are very many movements a child can do, which could be uh, spasms. And um, that's one of our most common admissions that we do to rule out infantile spasms. And um, uh, a lot of times it's not a spasm, but it's important to do that evaluation. They will often have a motor arrest or attenuated activity following the spasm. Uh, and um, if it's been going on for a while, there might be developmental delay or regression. And sometimes there's other seizure types. So even in your child who's been diagnosed with focal epilepsy who are following, if they start developing movements that could be infantile spasms, it could just be that. Uh, and we make this diagnosis on EEG and we like to make it promptly. Um, uh, patients who have this, uh, initially we put on ACTH, glucocorticoids, or vigabatrin, uh, and uh, we, again, rely on um, the primary care providers to help us out to monitor for side effects uh, with any of those medications. Next slide, please. So that is actually the conclusion of my talk. The references are listed right there, uh, and I hope this was informative. I hope I did achieve um, getting to all the objectives for everybody and I'm open to any questions or discussion.